So, so good evening, everyone. And um, actually, I do um, spend a lot of my time just relaxing. I'm pretty generally pretty lazy kind of monk, but um, this was uh, uh, to give you an idea of how lazy I am. This book um, was begun two, 20 years ago. So that's how long it's taken me to write this book. So, uh, <laughs> and um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the book, introduce just a little bit, and give a very short reading, and um, offer some reflections, um, and then like to open it up for more more general questions, so that um, everyone can feel that um, I'm uh, addressing things that they're interested in. So I, um, in the mid '80s or mid to late '80s. Um, when, uh, by which time Ajahn Chah um, was um, severely ill and had stopped speaking and was bedridden. Um, <clears throat> the, there was a, a kind of a split, not, not a serious schism as it were, but a, a difference of opinion amongst the senior monks, the disciples, the older generation felt that um, any preparation for Ajahn Chah's death um, would be um, somehow disrespectful or almost like um, uh, hastening his death, um, like almost like a curse. It's kind of an old, old way of looking at things. Um, but the, the other group, led by Lumpur Liam, who, who you will know, um, said, no, this is when he dies. Um, there's, it's going to be a huge event, and um, we really need to prepare for this. And um, his thinking won out, and they started um, major uh, renovations of the monastery, building a new Dhamma Hall, laying uh, concrete roads, and all kinds of preparations. Um, f and, uh, uh, and so when Lung Po Cha did uh, passed away in 1992, and then the, the following year, um, the the monks could um, devote themselves to the building of the the jedi of the stupa, um, in which he was cremated, and in which his relics are now are now stored. So one part of this um, uh, these preparations. Um, or, or one obvious area was uh, of uh, preparation of books of his teachings, and it was decided that a, um, a full biography should be written. And um, I was um, uh, asked to participate in this, um, and the the other Thai monk, uh, who was a nominal. Um, leader of the project, he he pulled out, so I was left as the the biographer, even though uh, my Thai prose style um, wasn't that um, good at that time. Really, I wasn't that confident that I could write well enough in Thai for a book of this stature. But uh, I did have a lot of ideas about what the book um, could and should consist of, and um, I conducted many um, interviews with um, monks and family members, and um, and I was given a great deal of help um, by various um, Sangha members, and um, the book was eventually published. To give you some idea of the you know, how the work involved in this was um, it was a cut and paste job, and what I mean by that was literally cutting and pasting with with scissors and paste. Um, <laughs> and so uh, typing something out and then xeroxing it, so like four and five, and then cutting paragraphs and rearranging them. And so it was very time consuming and um, big big project. So finally, it was completed, and I said, never again. And, Never again will I get involved in such a project. And I, I disappeared into the forest on retreat for over a year. And um, by this time, um, 
Yeah, there are various, but you really need to have an English version. Um, can you not out of compassion, et cetera, et cetera. You know, this is kind of like Buddhist blackmail, you know. And so, so, um, so okay, I agreed. So I spent 19, much of 1996 um, working on an English version. And I realized immediately that this would have to be a very different book from the Thai biography. One, that it could be a different book because I was that more um, confident in my ability to, to compose um, something in English than in, than in Thai. But um, also that I realized it would need far more context, background, um, in terms of Buddhist history, Thai Buddhist history, Thai Buddhist monastic history, Thai culture, Northeast Thai culture, monastic culture, so so much extra information would be needed. And I realized that it, this, this biography would provide um, a platform in which the whole Thai forest tradition could be presented and much information um, about the monk's discipline, for instance, um, could be uh, could be presented in a way that would um, that would otherwise be intimidating, or only the kind of things that would only be found in academic books. As you know, most Buddhists either read like meditation manual kind of books or or the very uh, academic kind of books. But it seemed to me that the biography of Ajahn Shah could combine these two. And um, so, after this um, rather intense year. Um, which was slow going because I don't find writing easy or or particularly enjoyable. Um, I I took over as the abbot of Wat Banana Chat and for the next five years more or less put this whole project to one to one side. Then I took early retirement and went uh, to live in my hermitage and uh, which I had almost no projects and I led a very lazy life for about five years. Um, and so 10 years had gone by, and then I started to um, look at the text again and just potter around in a, not a very uh, focused kind of way. And it went on like this for a number of years. So the, the text became like an old friend or almost like um, um, the, the sort of umbilical cord to, to Ajahn Chah, you know. So, um, and I realized much later that there was one part of me that didn't really want to finish this book because it was it was still you know uh, an expression of my relationship to Ajahn Chah. Um, and until finally, um, maybe two, three years ago, I was reminded by a senior monk that uh, 2018 would be the uh, 100th anniversary of his birth, and we really needed to have this biography. <laughs> um, and so I, um, I, I finally got down to work. And um, so the book is finished now, and the uh, it's in the publisher. The publisher's been published in in um, Kuala Lumpur, and um, there's also an ebook. And uh, I think probably the the most popular version is also an audio book, um, which will all be available next year. But although the audio, um, although the ebook is 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 ready now, um, I, think, I think it's better to wait until the 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 hardback book is available. Um, and so, for various reasons, I won't bore you with the 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 uh, the date uh, will be the first of March two thousand and eighteen, and probably the audio book for the hardback book and the ebook, and the audio book probably on Lumpur Chas. 100th birthday in June. Okay, that's a kind of a basic introduction. <clears throat> so, I'm going to do something very modern and radical for a Buddhist monk. I'm going to read from an iPad. Um, <laughs> I'm very, uh, I'm very self-conscious that this is going to go onto YouTube and I'll destroy my ascetic reputation. So I, I start the book with um, Ajahn Chah's funeral and his, uh, well, his death and his funeral. And then there's 
um, we go back to his birth and his early life, um, and then we we see his um, uh, in in his late thirties uh, his movement to to establish a monastery in 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 Ubon near his home village, and and then from there the the book for which is uh, quite a lot of um, uh, includes a lot of stories and narrative becomes much more of an analysis of his teaching and how he taught monks, how he taught nuns, how he taught Westerners, how he taught lay people, um, and so going through each each group and um, uh, in 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 some detail. So just to give you a warning, this book is eight hundred and forty pages long, so it's 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 um, plenty for you to get stuck into. So I'm actually not going to read very um, much of it to you today, but I'm going to read, um, maybe I'll read the first couple of pages, how about that, and then, um, and then the last page, which is the most personal page in the book, this one. Actually, that's fine. It's, it's too much. I'll just go to the last page. Okay. <laughs> As you can guess, I haven't really prepared this at all. Um, just about a minute. Okay, so um, in, in 1995, I wrote a poem uh, called Lung Po. Um, so uh, many of you will, will be familiar with the, uh, the name Ajahn Chah, but um, none of his disciples would ever use this word. Um, uh, we would always refer to him as Lung Po, which means Venerable Father. Uh, and it's a very warm and an intimate term. Um, and this poem is um, in the uh, in the book. Um, the it's attributed um, to Prachon, and um, so that's me. And um, Ajahn Chah didn't speak English um, at all which is one of the reasons why his disciples were so um, uh, diligent in learning Thai language. But, and he had difficulty with certain um, sounds. So my name is Sean, my original name is Sean, and uh, he couldn't pronounce this sh sound. And so he would make word, you know, he'd find a word that he was familiar with that was similar. Um, and so there is the Thai word, chon, which means spoon. <laughs> so um, this was my name, Venerable Spoon. And, and so I, I've signed this, this poem, like Venerable Spoon, Prachon. Um, there was a monk called Bruce, an Australian called Bruce, and he, couldn't, he can't pronounce it like S sound at the end of the word, so he made Burut. And Burut is actually, this is even more complex, is the, uh, the Thai version of Purisa, or person, so he was venerable person, and um, and a Japanese monk who was called Shibahashi, uh, he called Sibat Hasib, which means like four baht fifty. Yeah. <laughs> so so we all had these kind of names, you know. And um, so my name was Prachorn. <clears throat> so this this is a poem I wrote <clears throat> called Lumpur. <clears throat> <clears throat> Lung Po, you were a fountain of cool stream water in the square of a dusty town, and you were the source of that stream on a high, unseen peak. You were, Lung Po, that mountain itself, unmoved but variously seen. Lung Po, you were never one person, and you were always the same. You were the child laughing at the emperor's new clothes and ours. You were a demand to be awake, the mirror of our faults, ruthlessly kind. Lumpur, you were the essence of our texts, the leader of our practice, the proof of its results. 
you were a blazing bonfire on a windy, bone-chilled night. How we miss you. Lumpur, you were the sturdy stone bridge we had dreamed of. You were at ease in the present as if it were your own ancestral land. Lumpur, you were the bright full moon that we sometimes obscured with clouds. You were Ironwood, you were Banyan, and you were Bodhi. Poor Mare Kruba Ajan. Lumpur, you were a freshly dripping lotus in a world of plastic flowers. Not once did you lead us astray. You were a lighthouse for our flimsy rafts on the heaving sea. Lumpur, you are beyond my words of praise and all description. Humbly, I place my head beneath your feet. So that's the, the poem. Okay. So <clears throat> I would like to um, maybe expand upon a few of the, um, the lines of that poem. <clears throat> so um, this, uh, the, the background to this, this first, um, this first uh, phrase or first sentence um, was uh, as a, as a layman, um, after spending um, a lot of time in India, um, <clears throat> hitchhiked back from India to to England, and um, I decided before into Europe to to stop off in Greece, and uh, there was uh, an island quite close to the main road um, where I thought I'd go on retreat, and. Um, I, I had just enough money to get across on the ferry to this island. Um, and I was walking across the island and um, ended up sleeping under a tree and uh, woke up and started walking over the, like the ridge of this mountain and down to the southern um, beaches where I was planning to stay. And it was very, very hot and I was very, very dry. And I had uh, hadn't had a drink since the, the previous day, and I came to this small village, um, and um, there was a cistern and this stream water coming out of a tap in the um, in the middle of the town, of the village square, and uh, I remember just running towards this water and just putting my head under the tap and and uh, drinking from this cool, pure. Um, water from the mountains and thinking that was the most delicious drink I'd ever had in my life. And, and so this, this stayed with me um, and meeting Ajahn Chah, this, this, this is sense of that uh, cool, refreshing um, drink um, after being parched and, and uh, thirsty for a long time. So you were a fountain of cool stream water in the square of a dusty town. Um, but not only that, and you were the source of that stream on a high unseen peak. Um, so th when you meet um, a teacher um, like, like Ajahn Chah, it's, um, you know, the, there is this immediate um, response. Um, and... Um, a sense of, of joy, and at the same time, th this this sense of this is someone who is um, so uh, so mysterious in a way, so unfathomable, is more more than uh, you can grasp. So it's not just a drink, but there's a sense of it's coming from somewhere this high and mysterious, and and as yet inaccessible to you. And then you were, Lung Po, that mountain itself, unmoved but variously seen. Um, and so everyone has their own, everyone had their own Ajahn Chah. And, uh, uh, and it was somewhat humorous um, that the uh, Ajahn Chah would be a lot more relaxed speaking with the Westerners, a lot more informal. And uh, he, would, he would tell jokes and be a lot... And <clears throat> And the Westerners would, would think, yeah, no, like Lumpur really likes to be with the Westerners because he doesn't have to, you know, conform to this whole idea of being the big Ajahn and he can just really relax and, and uh, you know, he really likes that. 
Um, and so the, the like the Western conceit was, you know, we, we saw a side of Ajahn Chah that was that the Thai monks never really saw. And we felt kind of proud about that. Whereas the Thai monks, they they felt their Ajahn Chah was like the real Ajahn Chah. And, <laughs> and like the Westerners, you know, they're kind they're so um, craving this like individual attention. Um, and you have to really sort of uh, butter them up a bit, make them laugh a bit, and and uh, just sort of make a fuss of them. Otherwise, they can't handle this, you know, this life. And 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 so this is like Lumpur's great compassion that uh, he speaks with them like this because this is a way into into the life for them, and they need that kind of emotional warmth and and support um, in a way that the the Thai monks don't expect or need. So these, this is a very, perhaps a caricature, but this idea of how um, everyone had a different idea of, of Ajahn Chah and, and some of the monks who were with him in the very early days when he was um, extremely tough and all, the, the, the atmosphere at Wat Papong, I think you could almost call macho, you know, it was, it was super hardcore. And, um, you know, if you were sick, there's no way that you go to the hospital. You know, that's the last thing. You just sit and you deal with it. And the most you get is some um, some herbs in uh, uh, some borapet or something like this. Um, and and that changed. And um, there are different views for this. So um, one view amongst a few of the old monks is like Ajahn Chah just got soft, you know, like, those were the good old days, the golden days, you know, and it was so tough, you know, you you young blokes, you don't know what it's like when you, uh, you just, you, know, you just, you know, uh, we had it really tough. That, that you know, that, that kind of, whereas uh, you know, um, my view, uh, right or wrong, is, is that Ajahn Chah was someone who was constantly learning from his experiences. He didn't have like a fixed way of doing things. And this is the Ajahn Chah style. Um, and he found that that super tough, macho kind of approach is rather elitist in the sense that there are very few people who can hack it for very long. Um, and he could, for sure, but um, he didn't you know, as a, as a sustainable training for, uh, for his disciples, um, I think he, he, he found he needed to just to loosen it up just a little bit. I mean, it's still by, you know, pretty austere by, by most standards, but compared with the very earliest um, years, um, it was um, somewhat, somewhat easier. So this, so this view of Ajahn Chah as someone who had this, you know, incredibly pure and strong practice, but sort of went a bit soft as he got older, or someone who um, was constantly um, flexible and learning from what worked and not um, attaching to any sort of fixed idea of how it should be. You know, these are again different ideas about Ajahn Chah. Um, and there's so many, so many of these. And some, oh, he was so fierce, you know, and some people's, and, uh, and for many of the like at Lumpur Sumedho for someone, he's I never saw that side of him, he would say. Um, and and some people respond to that and, and expect it and see it. So so I like I like fierce teachers myself, because I'm I'm not fierce, I'm the opposite of fierce, but I, I really do like uh, and so I I remember and and um and cherish the times when he was fierce with me. Um um and it's, it's I'm the personality that really responds to that. Um, so uh, we all have this different view. So so in the poem I say, um, I see how to put my glasses on. Um, you were Lumpur, that mountain itself, unmoved but variously seen. Just so just as a mountain can be seen through the clouds and through the mist and a bright day and you can look up straight up or you can you know have various ways of looking at a mountain but it's um, the same mountain um, whatever the season and whatever the the atmospheric conditions um, Lumpur you were never one person you're always the same this is a, a paradox that um, 
he could um, so effortlessly change from this kind of fierce persona to a very kind persona <coughs> and, and, and seem to be completely effortless to the extent that, uh, you know, you couldn't say, what is his personality really? Um, it depends on, on the cause and conditions and, and, you know, what he was trying to, to convey. But although his, the way that he, he spoke or, or, or uh, related to people might vary um, for, you know, from, from person to person or from group to group, even in a single day or a single session, the feeling that you had was underlying this kind of um, very um, plastic or, or flexible kind of, um, was this constant um, concern for your well-being. So that even if he, he was kind of unpredictable and, and baffling sometimes or um, shocking even, that you, you had always the sense that this is, this is for your own good. This is, um, he sees this as what you need right now. Um, and this is, uh, you know, the essence of a teacher-student uh, relationship, where you're willing to do things that you you didn't really think you could do, or put up with things you don't really want to put up with, do things that you don't want to do, because um, you have that faith in the wisdom and compassion of the teacher. So, so my own, in my own case, when, when I arrived and when, from the very first moment, I would say, I, I just had this strong faith and confidence that, oh, so this is an arahant. You know, this is what an arahant is like. This, and of course, I don't have any um, you know, psychic powers or the ability to determine who is or is not an enlightened being, but this is the faith that arose. And uh, most of the Westerners who arrived at Wat Papong, and I'm talking about late 70s and down and, um, to the early 80s, we, we're all done, we've all read a fair amount of books. So we had the uh, um, intellectual foundation, really. Read too many books, probably is better. Um, and, um, and so, you, you know, the, the determining factor of whether you stuck it out as a, as a young novice or, or monk in the forest with all of the challenges of climate and, and diet and, and uh, fevers and illness and so on, um, was not so much the intellectual knowledge or the teachings that he gave, the, like the, the content of the teachings, but it was him himself as a constant reminder to you um, that this works, that this is a path that has a result. It's, it's doable. Um, and, that's, so, and that's the reason why even at the beginning when, when I didn't speak Thai very well or didn't speak Thai at all, I, I didn't really feel that I was missing out so much. Of course, I really wanted to be able to understand the Dhamma talks. Um, but it, it was in terms of my commitment to the, uh, to the monk's life, um, it was his presence and his example that um, really made the difference rather than any great profound teachings that he gave. Um, so he did, of course, he did give profound teachings and he was also very skillful in um, speaking in, in very simple terms and using uh, teachings that even those of us who had only rudimentary knowledge of Thai language could could appreciate um, in my own in my own case I was sweeping leaves one day and he was on one of his inspection tours and suddenly he realized oh Ajahn Chah is here and you and you squat down and and uh, so he he said to me chorn so he let <laughs> spoon he said uh, so um, and he said sabai me so sabai means like sort of comfortable, at ease, and it's a most common kind of greeting. Um, so are you doing okay? You know, are you are you are you sabai? Um, so I so I hold my hands. I says sabai cup. So it's very very polite, and 
and then he said, Sabaidime. So this is a bit more puzzling, you see, because it's more or less repeating the same question. But Sabaidi is that it sort of intensifies in it, like, are you really comfortable? But but the whole kind of momentum of the exchange is that you say, Sabaidi Khap, you know, say, yes, I'm very comfortable. Um, and then his whole face, his whole demeanor just changes, you know, like the... <laughs> you know, like the moon goes behind a cloud or something, or the sun goes behind a cloud, and he's just, Sabaidi Maidi. It's like, like uh, that's not good. Uh, you know, nobody ever says that, you know. And if you say, if you say Sabaidi, you said, oh, yes, very good, very good. And, and he says, that's, that's bad. So that this is really not what you say in this kind of um, conversation. And and then he walks off, and you and you think, what was all that about? You know, and then, <laughs> you, um, you have no idea, and you think you've done something wrong, but you're not quite sure what. You know, and uh, um, so it's sort of walking up and down, so by do you may do, you know, and uh, so so you don't need a big vocabulary, okay? This is like sort of basic um, nursery school time, but um, so my my uh, conclusion was that. You know, when you first enter a monastery, you've got so many defilements. Um, and if you're really practicing, you should be going against the stream of defilements. This is the, the, whole, um, the, the whole thrust of the, the way of life, is to, um, is to um, illuminate the defilements by going against them. It's one of the most basic principles of monastic life. Um, and that being the case, um, you you shouldn't be too comfortable. Um, if you are comfortable, it means you're not doing the work. Um, you're taking it too easy. Um, so this so this is the teaching that I got. And so so you know I can remember it as if it was yesterday, and so it's stuck in my mind. And um, but this was the thing with Ajahn Chah. You know, every single thing he ever said to you, you you, you remember. Um, I can remember feeling so proud one day, I mean, just beaming, because he corrected my pronunciation of, of a word. You know, there's this a sense of, of connection that he cares enough to, uh, even, even on that level. So the, um, and this is not um, peculiar to me, I think almost everyone uh, has the same experience. So, and and um, there was one occasion when um, Ajahn Sumato came to visit, and and Lumpur gave a, a wonderful talk. And by this time, because I've been there about a year, so I could understand reasonably well. And and the the, the gist of the talk was that the world is just the wor the way it is. It's not good or it's not bad. It's just like this. Um, but we make problems because of our expectations and our desires and our fears and because we uh, we want it to be a certain way. Um, but we, we realize it's it's this way because the causes and conditions uh, are like this. It's it's, uh, it's basically it's it's uh, it's perfect. In other words, it's just not not in the sense it's the best of all possible, things, but it's the only uh, it's the only thing that could given all the causes and conditions um, that are prevailing at this moment, this is the only and natural result of them. Um, so this, this is, uh, as I remember, the gist of the talk. So <clears throat> at the end, we, we go up and uh, a few of us w would go up and, and uh, it's time for him to rest. And so this is a very cold um, December night. Um, and so, um, you know, if you're really lucky, you've got the chance to put his socks on. You know, this is, so I... Uh, I I put his socks on inside out, and he said, "John, hey, you put my socks on inside out." And I said, "It's perfect, just like that." <laughs> 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 um, and and he and he smiled at me. He said, "Ah, oh, you you listened to the talk tonight." He said, "So." Uh, so this is a, this is the kind of thing that a w young Westerner would say that a Thai would just uh, you know would die rather than um, be so so forward and impudent. But uh, you know, Lung Po saw, saw the funny side of it. Um, anyway, carrying on. 
So, um, you were the child laughing at the emperor's new clothes and ours. So I think you're probably all familiar with this uh, Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale with the king who you know wants the very, very refined cloth and more and more rich and, 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 uh, and eventually he gets um, cheated by this guy who, who um, tells him this is the most refined cloth and actually it's nothing at all. And the emperor goes out completely naked and he's so proud of himself that he's wearing this, um, <clears throat> this um, very, very fine cloth. And nobody dares say anything um, except for one small boy who looks up and he says, the emperor's naked. <laughs> um, um, so you probably know this story from your childhood. But I, I, I've always found it a, you know, a, um, a wonderful um, image of, the, of this, the mind which is um, not willing just to um, believe things because everyone else believes them or just to do things simply because everyone else believes them and is is willing to 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 stand stand up and and say no it does i don't think that's true and and i i see ajahn char as as, as being um, that way and being uh, willing to point at the our foolishness and our and our desires and and the things that we lie to ourselves about and, and uh, deceive ourselves and and again he was very so skillful in this um, particularly in the case of the westerners um, noticed that he very he very quickly realized that you know we have the, the westerners have this kind of you know arrogance and self-consciousness and um <clears throat> and and um very often very difficult to receive um admonition uh, often through past experiences of carrying um, <clears throat> memories of past experiences of, of being told off or told that you're bad or hopeless or something like this. Um, and Jin Chav found very, very soon that if you could um, um, make the Westerner see the humorous side of it and just laugh at themselves a little bit, chuckle at your own foolishness, um, that would open open them up to to the teaching and this um, recognition that they're, they're the emperor with no clothes on. So that that ability to um, really uh, pitch the teaching um, in a way that was appropriate to the student and particularly appropriate to the uh, the defenses and the, you know this there's one part of us that um, desires liberation and craves for truth um, but it's often coexists um, with an equally strong desire uh, or to um, turn away from and distract oneself from uh, the the truth of things and and in meditation you know you come across this very recalcitrant very very deeply embedded defilements and you think sometimes you can become discouraged, you know, trying all these skillful means and still, you know, it just don't seem to be getting anywhere with this. Um, and I think that, that often the the cause is that we're overlooking the fact that there's, there's one part of us that really cherishes that defilement. We want that defilement to be there. So there's one part of your mind that, that wants to be free of it, and is the other part of your mind that doesn't want to be free of it at all. Um, I'll give, give an, an example is, is anger. And very, you know, so yeah, anger is a really bad thing and it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a defilement and, and so on. So be very pious about anger. But um, anger, there's a charm to anger. Um, there's something about anger that's really um, uh, desirable. And particularly if you're in a um, position of, of powerlessness, so this is particularly um, attractive. Um, so you know the the powerless group in society have, um, for thousands of years, been women. Okay, so if you're a woman, um, you say something, and you know men don't pay much attention at all, um, or just um, rather. Um, overlook or, or play it down or ignore it altogether. 
So <clears throat> if you're if you're a woman and you want to be heard, you know, what's the best way to be heard? Get angry. Yeah. Because once you're angry, people stop and listen. And this is the charm of anger. This is this is the bait. You know, this is the hook. Um when you're angry, you feel powerful and people treat you with respect and people listen to you in a way that they wouldn't listen to you otherwise. Um, and that's a drug. There's this, it's it's uh, intoxicating. Um, so in the defilements, you have this kind of intoxicating factor. This this um, some this the hook that holds us on. So unless we recognise that hook and recognise what is the psychological benefit that we 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 feel we're receiving from this defilement, um, only then and and being willing to abandon that and relinquish that that the the effort to deal with defilements will will really bear fruit but often there's this inner conflict between like a tug of war that maybe we're not so conscious of but you can be sure that if there's any um, defilement in your mind that you've been working with for years and you just don't seem to be making much progress it's basically because an important part of you really wants that to be there you're not yet ready to let go of it. You fear it, and um, and I think the 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 unenlightened mind is al- is always of the view something is better than nothing. Okay, so something, whatever it is, is better than nothing. So this is why you have really inte- you have doctors who uh, who smoke, or you have pe- you know people in, in other areas of life very intelligent, but they uh, caught up in very foolish um, activities and. Um, and it's not that um, they are blind to the drawbacks and the suffering inherent in that habit, but they say, yeah, um, it's an imperfect and flawed kind of happiness for sure, but it's better than nothing. Yeah, that, that's, that's the, the, the wrong thinking that we have to make conscious. Um, and, and Ajahn Shah had this um, beautiful um, simile or uh, humorous simile for this. He says it's like someone carrying this big rock on their back, you know, and, say, and then, oh dear, it's so heavy, it's so, oh, yeah, it's such a miserable existence carrying this big rock around on my back all the time, and what can I do? And, and, and so the teacher says, well, put it down. I said, well, I couldn't do that. So why not? Well, I wouldn't have anything to carry around anymore. <laughs> yeah, so when it's put in those terms, it, it, it's humorous. But the, look at the, the psychology of that, you know the, 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 you know, the sense that we have of these things that are like a burden on our back. Um, and, and we recognize that this is really causing us a lot of pain. But yet we can't do that very simple thing of just putting it down because we're afraid of the alternative. We're, af- we're afraid that no- there'll be nothing in return. And we'd rather have, we'd rather the devil we know than the devil we don't. Um, so these are the kinds of things that we need to be really um, looking at in practice. These kinds of uh, attachments and fears, the, you know, the fear, of, fear of letting go. This is a really big one, isn't it? Fear of pain, Fear of suffering, uh, fear of letting go, fear of having nothing, and um, and and with this uh, in this particular point, the, like the fear of letting go, this is why it's so uh, so stressed that the first level of practice or the the path, the door into Buddhism, is the development of generosity and giving, because when you give. Um, with a pure heart, meaning that you don't uh, desire any kind of reward, whether it's a material reward or some kind of emotional um, reward, then um, you you are experiencing a small death every time every time you give. Um, you are something that you you have considered to be mine, something that I I've earned. It's me. It's mine. Um, and you're making that decision uh, to share one part of that um, for no 
uh, no sorts of self-aggrandizement at all, simply to support something that you find admirable or inspiring or to reduce the amount of pain and suffering in the world. And when you give, um, and this is not, and, and this effect is not determined by how much you give, um, but when you give, you experience joy. And it's a, it's a long-lasting joy. It's what we call a noble treasure. It means that if you've given in that way, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years later, when you bring that act of goodness and kindness and generosity to mind, you will feel refreshed. You will feel happy. You will feel uplifted. And what what you're doing right from the uh, on the basic material level, you are proving to yourself. You you are creating this perception, this memory in your mind that giving, sharing, uh, letting go is joyful. And and so on the path of letting go, um, you begin on the material level of letting go of your selfishness and your attachment. This is mine. Uh, don't come anywhere. This is mine, okay? And you're trying to reduce the power of that. And this is how you develop um, the first um, uh, strength, this, this strength of giving and renunciation, which will enable you eventually to let go of your attachment to form, and feelings, and perceptions, and thoughts, and emotions, and sense consciousness to five khandhas. So you, you, there's always this movement in, in the Buddhist training from the coarse to the refined. And in this letting go, you begin with, of course, the, let the giving and sharing of the material wealth that you possess. Um, and that giving without any, um, any expectation and any desire for any kind of reward is the purifying and uplifting factor that we call punya, or merit. So merit is that action of body, speech, and mind that purifies or uplifts the mind. <clears throat> so Lumpur, you were the essence of our texts, the leader of our practice, the proof of its results. Um, so speaking of texts, I, um, it, it's when you read the, the teachings of the Thai forest masters, um, it, sometimes it can bring up some doubts because um, it's not always... Um, exactly um, in line with what we find in the Tipitaka. And uh, this can, can cause some uh, disturbance. So I have a simile for this because uh, often people can ex understand things through similes. So my simile um, is derived from a memory I have. Um, when I was um, so at school, remember there was a, a glossy Sunday magazine um, that um, had an, an article in which the photographer um, went to the site of some of the most famous landscape paintings um, in, in Western art, particularly from the, the, um, the Impressionists, Expressionists. And they, and they printed the, the, the photograph and the painting side by side. And, and what was um, fascinating to me was that in, in certain cases, the, the, the painter had exaggerated um, the, uh, a hill. It's a little bit larger in the painting than it is in the, or the colors, or shifted something from slightly from one side of the painting to the other. So this is obviously not because of, a, you know, if it was me, it was because I just sort of uh, wasn't a very good artist and made a mistake or something, but you know these are obviously brilliant artists, and it's a it's a reasonable choice. And and the second um, thought I had was that somehow the it, it seemed that the painting could basically bring out the 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 whole sense of the, like the spirit of the place in some cases more successfully than the photograph. Has more of an emotional impact and more, more, more moving, touching. 
So, so my 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 simile here is that the teachings in the in the Tipitaka in the suttas are like a photograph of the truth, and the teachings of uh, various ajans and teachers are like paintings of the truth, like paintings of great masters, and so it it, it doesn't really matter that this this is not exactly uh, related to that because. The, from the vision of the truth, the painter is creating something which is meant to impress you with the the essence of um, of that uh, landscape or of that that landscape of truth. So this is a way that I've um, um, that I've come to understand some of the apparent minor discrepancies um, and. Um, and Lumpur Cha once once said, you know, you won't find all of my, you won't find all of my teachings um, within the Tipitaka, within the, the the suttas, but you won't find anything in them that contradicts with the suttas. Um, so he has his own own way of talking. Um, So he's the leader of our practice, and one of the reasons, like when Ajahn Chah was a, a young monk, he, um, like he he took he started the monastery in his late thirties, and and most of the monks are like in their twenties, and you know I grew up in like in England, it's your idea of a monk is a kind of you know like skinny a fate sort of you know, um, you, you 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 have the idea, yeah. And then you come to Northeast Thailand, and these monks are like this, you know, these muscles like this, you know, they're they're like peasant farmers, you know, and they're, and they're so tough and they're so strong, and you know, it's it's completely, you know, not at all. But so there is that kind of, you know, that strong kind of masculine kind of energy, and as I say, certainly in the, in the early days. And so if you you look at uh, Ajahn Chah's Dhamma talks. Um, early days to the monks, you have all this martial imagery, you know, like of, you know, warrior, warrior talk or um, boxing imagery, you know, some martial arts imagery. So you've got to fight their defilements and you've got to cut off their heads and, you know, this, this, kind, of, this kind of... And for if you're like a, a young man in your 20s and you've spent your life on a far, on a rice farm, this is exactly the kind of, um, you know, inspiration um, that you want. But most importantly, uh, Lumpur Cha never um, encouraged his students to to do something that he didn't do himself. So, you know, we'd have the every um, the eighth um, day of the moon and the fifteenth day of the moon, half moon and full moon and dark moon, and then everyone was expected to um, to spend the whole night in meditation, no one's allowed to go to to rest for the whole night. Um, and Ajahn Chah would be sitting there the whole night in the in the sala. It wasn't they said, you know, you should do this. This is good for you, but I'm I'm just going back for rest. I don't need to do this anymore. Um, he was always the leader of the practice, and this is what um, uh, earned him this incredible loyalty from his students. That he he always uh, not only did he um, pitch in and do all the difficult things that he was expecting of his students, but he did even more than the uh, the monks. So he you know and then he would give talks sometimes to you know ten o'clock, eleven o'clock, twelve o'clock at night, and um, still everyone was expected to be. Um, there in the in the sala at three o'clock in the morning and uh, for the morning chanting, um, and if uh, and if the bell ringer never came on time, he would be the one who rang the bell because he'd always be there before everybody else. So that that's incredibly um, you know strengthening and and uh, inspiring if you're in that kind of situation. Um, he was the proof of its results, and he said, "You were a blazing bonfire on a windy." Bone chilled night. Yeah, so that's clear, I think. Um, you were, so these are expressions of devotion. You were the sturdy stone bridge we had dreamed of. And, and this next phrase, you were as at ease in the present 
as if it were your own ancestral land. So, so the image there is, you know, if you've got like the Lord of the Manor or someone who's, you know, um, a king just sort of striding around in his own land, you know, completely at ease and um, completely his own man, as it were. And I had this felt this is like Ajahn Chah, Lumpur Chah's relationship to the present moment. You know, he's just so totally there in the present moment and so like settled back into it and without any sense of sense of effort. I think if you if you um if you read literature of like elite elite um sports um people and, and then people writing assessments of what made them so special as a tennis player, as a golfer or as a footballer or whatever. And and a recurrent observation um of someone at the very top of their um of of their sport is that they seem to have more time than anybody else um so obviously it's clock time they have exactly the same but there seem to be this sense of unhurriedness in their stroke or in their um uh, in their strike of the ball or whatever it might be and i think with with Ajahn Chah, there's this sense you know he is completely unhurried. He's t totally at home in the present moment, and so this is this is my image of the the Lord of his ancestral land, just walking around. This is totally at home. Let me see anything else. Um, you were the bright full moon that we sometimes obscured with clouds. Yeah. So. Um, you see, kindness um, and compassion, you have uh, this uh, short-sighted kind of grandmotherly kindness, you know, grandkid wants a cookie, give it to him. Um, but the, the kindness and compassion of a teacher um, is much more profound. And, and one part of it is uh, like a teacher of this stature is willing for the student to be angry with him. He doesn't always want to be liked and loved by his students. He wants the student to grow in the Dhamma. And that might mean um, doing and saying things that will have a strong negative emotional reaction from the student. Um, and the teacher is willing to bear with that because he sees the long-term um, value of it. And uh, Ajahn Chah would, would, uh, would use the, the worldly Dhammas as as a tool, I, again, I, I give a um, example from my own. Um, so I I really wanted to be the uh, you know, uh, one of his attendants, but at the beginning, I my language uh, wasn't so so good, obviously, and uh, very different, difficult to learn Thai. We didn't have books, and no, and none of the people around me really spoke very good Central Thai. They all spoke dialect and. So I was speaking Lao dialect before I was speaking Central Thai, and um, so I was I was with uh, Ajahn Chah, and and um, and so a group of lay people came, and he pointed to me. You see that? You see? You look. He looks like a Westerner, doesn't he? But he's a Lao, <laughs> and oh, I just felt so proud, you know. That, you know, I'm 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 a Lao. I like I'm sort of like at the inner circle, you know. I'm at the um, and so then afterwards these people left and uh, he took out his false teeth and, and, and so this would be one of our jobs you take his false teeth and, and you clean them with sand you see and so, and so but once he takes out his false teeth it's almost impossible to understand you know, so, so after just praising me to all these people so I'm just up in the clouds just so happy you know well, he's only been here such a short time, and he's got the language down. You know, he's all, f you know, Lao is brilliant. Um, and then he takes out his teeth, and he's, like, <laughs> and I can't understand a single word. And he says, "Oh, you, you know, you're hopeless. You can't, you can't do anything. He's an attendant. You can't understand what I want." And and somebody else come over. So this is this is very you know, the way he taught. You see, it's not always you know these profound dhamma teachings, but he's. He's, he, he, he praises you so that you can see how you feel about that and then suddenly criticizes you. Um, and it's like, the, you know, the whole world falls apart. You know? 
um, and and this is this is the the teaching he he was giving us, um, so that um, that kind of compassion, like he's saying, he's he's he doesn't want always to be popular with his students, and and as a teacher, that's a real danger, isn't it? I mean, I, I I'm teaching, uh, talking to school teachers a lot. You know, this is teachers often they, they suffer so much because they want all the kids to love them. Um, and I find it very difficult when when they don't. Um, but that's not your, you know, that's not the role of a teacher to uh, to make yourself popular with your students. A teacher is someone who's trying to um, gauge the very pos the best um, way to uh, communicate with them so that they can they can learn. It's, this is we're here together to learn, not just to create this kind of um, happy atmosphere. Um. So you were ironwood, you were banyan, and you were bodhi. So these are different um, types of trees. Um, obviously, and you know what the ironwood is very hard and, and resilient kind of wood. And um, banyan, as you know, and, and bodhi tree. So these are all symbols of, um, sort of noble qualities. Um, the next word you, you probably weren't familiar with is poor mare kruba ajan. So this is um, an idiom that we use in in northeast northeast Thailand, um, so poor means father, and mare means mother. Kruba Ajan means teacher. So um, we 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 would sometimes talk to him, say, uh, "Poor mare Kruba Ajan," so like as a, as a, a way of addressing him. So what we're saying is, "You are my mother. You're my father. You're my teacher. You're everything to me." Um, and this is uh, sort of the most heartfelt. Our way of expressing our, our feeling towards uh, our teacher in in Northeast Thailand. <coughs> uh, so Lumpur, you were a freshly dripping lotus in the world of plastic flowers, and this this is a image that came to my mind and the like the very first day that I met Ajahn Chah. Just what it, trying to articulate to myself. You know how, what, how I felt, and what was this effect, and this feeling that it wasn't like, like there was some kind of a special kind of you know you, when we think about um, charismatic teachers, often we think like there's a glow, you know, wow, you know. So, but that that wasn't um, necessarily the case. I mean, sometimes you see this this glow, and it's often people are loony, basically, you know, some some really weird and, and uh, mentally deranged people are extremely bright and, and shiny. Um, so don't be, uh, don't be taken by that. Um, <laughs> so that, that's a whole different story. Um, but I felt that, that it was like another simile I had was if you'd only ever, ever heard people singing songs out of tune, um, and then suddenly you heard someone sing with perfect pitch for the first time, and you think, "Oh, that's what that's what a song's supposed to sound like." Um, and if you'd only ever um, you'd only ever seen plastic flowers, and you'd never seen a real flower in your life, um, and then suddenly you this, "Oh, that's what a flower is," and you realize everything that you've seen before wasn't actually a flower; it was a, um, a plastic um, fabrication. And so this this sense of absolute sort of groundedness and naturalness and 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 um, uh, earthiness, basically normality, in the sense that everyone else is basically a little bit off key, a little bit uh, abnormal, and this is like the first normal person, totally normal person I've ever met in my life. And that that that's more like the like so so not something extraordinary. But a sense of this is this is how a human being could and should be, and we're all you know we're all a long way away from that, and then that sort of self consciousness and and all the desires and expectations distort our human beings in a way that we're so familiar with it it's not it's our norm it's normal to us, and this is the value of meeting someone of this stature. She, Oh, this is what a human being can be. You know, this is the, um, this is uh, the possibility. This is the hope. This is the, 
um, something that can be experienced in this day and age by someone who was started off life as an ordinary villager in northeast Thailand, but he's he's reached this level, and and if he can, then other people can. So that's. Uh, so I'm going on a lot, lot longer. I'm, I'm almost at the end now. Not once did you lead us astray. Now this is um, this is true. I mean, it was absolute. The integrity of of, uh, of Ajahn Chah was was legendary, but it's also a reference to a, a, um, a sutta that you may be familiar with, and this is the seven qualities of the the good friend. So there are various ways we can talk about what a, what a good friend means, but the good friend at the highest level is the spiritual teacher. So the ideal spiritual teacher, not a guru, but the, the, the good friend or the best possible friend. Um, and the qualities of, of um, the good friend on this level are one, um, they inspire love and affection, devotion is like with, with Ajahn Chah, you know, he could be talking about anything you know, absolutely, and you just want to be there, and you don't want to go anywhere else, and you won't go anywhere else until he drives you away, you know. Um, and that that sense, you just, uh, you just the, the, the feelings of, of love and affection that someone of that stature, right, this is a sign of a, um, of a great being, and he inspires respect, um, and you, you see the way he lives his life and the way that he comports himself. And this is a sense of respect and admiration. Thirdly, he inspires emulation. So the, 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 the good friend at this level, he, he inspires love, affection, devotion, respect, and emulation. Um, and in himself is someone who has great patience. Uh, he's patient with his students and his, uh, the weaknesses and vices and defilements. Um, of his students and the needs um, of of his students and the responsibilities that he uh, take or she takes upon themselves um, as somebody who um, is a skilled communicator as someone who knows um, how to speak to different people at different times and different places of different backgrounds and so Ajahn Chah said, "I don't, I can't speak English or German or Japanese or so, but I know the language of civil servants. I know the language of shopkeepers. I know the language of rice farmers. I know the language of military people. I know all these languages, and and his ability to adapt his vocabulary, the similes, the metaphors, the tone of voice, um, to uh, uh, to." exactly correspond with the needs of his audience uh, was, was a marvelous thing to see. And he was someone who um, could um, explain the most difficult and abstruse and profound topics in simple language. Now, I think there's an important um, uh, point to be made here, and, and uh, it was made by um, Einstein. So Einstein said, you know, things should be expressed as simply as possible, but no more simply. Now, what that, that means is sometimes we want these uh, difficult things explained simply, and when they're simple, then we just, we love that, and we immediately grasp onto it, um, but maybe sometimes a little bit carelessly. Um, because sometimes things are too simple, um, and they don't explain fully the the difficult. Because some things are difficult, and we can't explain everything so simply. And if we desire everything should be simple, um, then we can easily get misled. So he was someone, uh, or the two great teachers, someone who can explain things as simply as they can be, but not any more simple than that meaning not in a such a way that they are um, distorting the profundity of the teachings. And the last of these qualities is, is someone uh, who never abuses his position of power and authority. Um, and, and of, of course, um, you know, the last weeks and, you know, in the world, and there's a whole stories of, of how powerful people, powerful men, you abusing their authority um, in their relations with more vulnerable women, 
um, and this is a, uh, in every uh, society and every organization that this uh, constant theme of people with authority abusing authority and the the great teacher is someone who has um, an, an, you know a great deal of authority um, it's not just um, um, you know the authority of, of a boss but someone who you looked up to in every in every way um, and there are the feelings of love and affection and gratitude and so on um, that arise so easily and this is the, the the great teacher will never take advantage of that never um, abuse a student or take advantage in any any kind of way this is a sign of the um, the great friend of the Kalyana Mitta and I think that Ajahn Chah was a wonderful example of that and so to to end the poem um, oh you were a lighthouse for our flimsy rafts on the heaving seas or a guide and a light and a, um, giving us direction in this um, difficult um, practice of, of uh, overcoming defilements and Lumpur, you are beyond my words of praise and all description. Humbly, I place my head beneath your feet. So that's the, the end of the poem. Thank you.